Good morning. I'll once again call on the Honorable Premier to lead us in prayer. Good morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, from whom all wisdom and power are derived, we beseech thee so to direct and prosper the deliberations of the Legislative Assembly now assembled, that all things may be ordered upon the best and surest foundations for the glory of thy name and for the safety, honor, and welfare of the people of these islands. Bless our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth II, Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Charles, Prince of Wales, and all the royal family. Give grace to all who exercise authority in our commonwealth, that peace and happiness, truth and justice, religion and piety may be established among us. Especially we pray for the governor of islands, the premier, the speaker of the legislative assembly, the leader of the opposition, ministers of the cabinet, ex officio members and members of the legislative assembly, that we may be enabled faithfully to perform the responsible duties of our high office. All this we ask for thy great name's sake. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace now and always. Please be seated. Administration of oaths or affirmations? None. Written by the Honorable Speaker of Messages and Announcements. I am not in possession of any notification for absence or late attendance. Presentation of petitions? None. The mental, sorry, presentation of papers and of reports. Mental Health Commission Annual Report 2015 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Premier, Minister of Home Affairs, Health and Culture. I recognize the Honorable Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the annual report of the Mental Health Commission for the year 2015. So ordered. Does the Honorable Premier wish to speak to this report? Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Section 8A of the Mental Health Commission Law 2013, I'm pleased today to present to this Honorable House the annual report of the Mental Health Commission for the calendar year 2015. Madam Speaker, the Mental Health Commission was established in January 2014 under the Mental Health Commission Law 2013. The current members are Dr. Mark Lockhart, Chairman, Dr. Taylor Burroughs, Deputy Chair, Mr. Oliver Watler, Deputy Co-Chair, our co-deputy chair, Mrs. Julian Banks, member, Mrs. Kimberly Voden, member, Mrs. Faleen Ebanks-Saku, member, Pastor Dale Forbes, member, Dr. Inoka Richens, member, and Ms. Vanessa Gilman, 
member. Madam Speaker, the members are stakeholders from the various sectors representing legal, healthcare practitioners with training in mental health, and advocates and lay persons. The functions of the Mental Health Commission are divided into three sections. The quasi-judicial section is set up to hear and determine appeals on the various sections of the law and conduct reviews where a patient has been detained and released on an emergency detention order three or more times in 30 days. The recommendations to the Health Practice Commission and Council's section include submitting an annual report to the Minister with responsibility for health, reviewing and advising on scopes of practice and codes of ethics for practitioners, providing policy advice to the relevant registering councils and advising the Health Practice Commission regarding mental health facilities, medical research and clinical trials in mental, in mental health. The general functions section includes the following. Obtain and compile statistics on mental health, oversee and deliver mental health training for constables, prison officers and any other persons expected to deal with mental health patients in the performance of their functions, approve a list of overseas mental health facilities, research and establish protocols and guidelines for mental health advocacy, and approve persons to act as advocates. Establish and maintain a program that provides information to the general public concerning mental illness and co-occurring disorders and related conditions. Review the progress of patients transferred overseas. Review every six months the progress of remand prisoners deemed unfit to plead and submitted to the chief officer, judicial administration. Give policy advice to the minister responsible for health on any aspect of the local mental health system. Madam Speaker, I will now speak to the contents of the report. Mental health services are delivered through the Health Services Authority, local private facilities, and mental health care facilities located overseas. The Behavioral Health and Psychiatric Unit, which was formerly known as the Mental Health Unit at the Health Services Authority, is an eight-bed unit that was designed as an adult facility for acute care of patients suffering from serious mental illnesses. There is also a facility providing treatment for patients suffering from alcohol and substance abuse. While Her Majesty's Cayman Islands Prison Service accommodates mentally ill prison persons who have been incarcerated. There is no inpatient facility for children and adolescents, but if necessary, they are admitted to the unit where they are treated. Madam Speaker, as stated in the first report of the Mental Health Commission last year, there is an adequate number of mental health practitioners employed in public and private sectors. However, the distribution of practitioners among the three islands is disproportionate, as there is no psychiatrist, no psychiatrist, psychologist, or occupational therapist present on the sister islands. Madam Speaker, we are committed to improving our outpatient services so that the care that is needed is accessible in a timely manner to all. As you may be aware, Madam Speaker, in February 2015, Cabinet granted approval of the policy guidance for the development of a long-term residential mental health facility. This document outlines the broad policy direction to be followed by the steering committee, which was charged with the procurement process for the development of the facility. Subsequently, the strategic outline case was finalized and a request for proposal for proposals was advertised. Madam Speaker, the successful bidder was KPMG, which was awarded the contract in October 2015 to prepare an outline business case for a proposed long-term residential mental health facility. The training on the mental health legislation provided by the Mental Health Commission has been in high demand. Madam Speaker, you may recall that in 2014, the Mental Health Commission provided two training sessions. In 2015, the Mental Health Commission conducted six training sessions to the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service, 
the Department of Community Rehabilitation, Prison Services, staff of the Health Services Authority, including members of the support group and the community, and the Department of Education Services, allied health professionals, specialists, teachers. Madam Speaker, training sessions will continue on a regular basis in 2016. There is a requirement under the Mental Health Law 2013 for all detention forms to be sent to the Secretary of the Mental Health Commission for storage and filing. The forms are reviewed by the Secretary to determine whether the members of the Mental Health Commission need to be notified of any outstanding issues or observations. Madam Speaker, for the year 2015, there were 43 patients admitted for various types and degrees of mental illness with over 75 detention forms received. During this period, no request for an appeal was received by the Commission. Madam Speaker, in order to assist the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service with understanding their roles and responsibilities under the mental health legislation, the Mental Health Commission developed a one-page flyer that can be distributed among the three islands. Madam Speaker, the flyer was officially handed over by the Chief Officer and the Chair of the Mental Health Commission to the Deputy Commissioner of Police. In November 2015, the Chair of the Mental Health Commission presented at an annual health care conference on the topic, Bridging the Gap, the State of Mental Health in the Cayman Islands. There were more than 700 participants in attendance. As well, a workshop was held focusing on mental health Let's talk about it. Madam Speaker, the annual healthcare conference has helped to highlight the importance of mental illness and health within the community among friends, families, and caregivers. It has given new meaning to mental health as people have become more knowledgeable, acceptable, and tolerant of those persons who suffer from a mental illness. Madam Speaker, the Ministry, with technical and financial assistance provided by the Pan American Health Organization, convened a stakeholder meeting for one and a half days to develop a national mental health policy. Consultant psychiatrist Professor Wendell Abel from Jamaica facilitated the meetings. The Ministry is awaiting the final draft of the policy. Other work of the Mental Health Commission during 2015 involved participation in World Mental Health Day activities celebrated each year on 10th of October. Participation at the Second Caribbean Regional Symposium on Suicide Prevention hosted in the Cayman Islands. Collaborating with the Health Services Authority Ethics Committee to ensure that persons conducting research on mental health fulfill established criteria and working with the councils for professions allied with medicine to develop scopes of practice for mental health practitioners registered on the councils for professions allied with medicine. Madam Speaker, before I take my seat, I would like to acknowledge the work of Deputy Chair Dr. Taylor Burroughs, who was accepted by the Caribbean Public Health Agency to present the findings of her doctoral research in a poster presentation at the annual scientific conference held in June 2015. I would like to congratulate her on being selected and to encourage her to continue to raise the awareness on mental health in the wider community. Madam Speaker, in order to mitigate many of the problems in our society that we currently face, I believe we must facilitate early recognition and treatment of common mental illnesses by enhancing access to mental health care through an integrated approach. The Mental Health Commission will continue to educate, inform, and empower those individuals who require our assistance. Madam Speaker, we have a Mental Health Commission that is committed and has been working diligently since its formation. And the Mental Health Commission continues to advocate and promote mental wellness for all in the community. We are one step closer since our last report in addressing the need for a long-term residential mental health facility for chronically ill mental health patients. Madam Speaker, in closing, I would like to thank my Chief Officer and Ministry staff, and
and the members of the Mental Health Commission for their hard work, dedication and commitment to a subject that affects all of us. Indeed, the World Health Organization notes, there is no health without mental health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Health Insurance Amendment Regulation 2016 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Premier, Minister of Home Affairs, Health and Culture. Recognize the Honorable Premier. Madam Speaker, I would like to lay on the table of this Honorable House proposed amendments to the health insurance regulations. As is outlined in the motion, section 25.2 of the health insurance law revision provides that regulations made under the law are subject to affirmative resolution by the Legislative Assembly. Madam Speaker, I'm therefore tabling those regulations to be affirmed by this Honorable House. The proposed amendments are made up of two clauses. So order. Please proceed, Honorable Premier. The proposed amendments are made up of two clauses. Clause one on page three provides a citation and the commencement. Honorable members will note that the proposed commencement of the amended regulations is after the Health Insurance Amendment Law 2016 comes into force. I will be speaking to the, those amendments to the insurance, health insurance law when we deal with the bills later in this meeting. Madam Speaker, Clause 2 on page 3 repeals sub-regulation 1 of regulation 5 and substitutes a new sub-regulation. Under the new provision, the Cayman Islands National Insurance Company will pay $10 per month of each premium charged under each standard health insurance contract in respect of an insured person with no dependents, and $20 per month of each premium charged under each standard health insurance contract in respect of an insured person with dependents. However, Madam Speaker, with these amendments, this contribution to the contributions outlined above will not apply to persons in the following categories for whom government affects a contract of health insurance. Each officer in a pensionable office or in probation to such an office. Each officer serving under a local or overseas contract. Each officer in a temporary office. Each public officer pensioner. Each indigent person. Each elected member of the Legislative Assembly. And where the speaker is not a member of the Legislative Assembly, the speaker. Each past elected member of the Legislative Assembly who is a public office pensioner, the dependents of any person specified above, a seaman 55 years of age or older and his dependents, a widow of a seaman, a veteran and his dependents, a widow of a veteran, and any other person approved by cabinet. All other approved health insurance providers will continue to pay $10 per month of each premium charged under each standard health insurance contract for individual policyholders with no dependents, and $20 per month of each premium charged under each standard health insurance contract for individual policyholders with dependents. Members of this Honorable House are likely to be aware that these funds are collected into what is called the Segregated Insurance Fund and that fund is used by the government towards the cost of health care for indigent persons. Madam Speaker, during the preparation of the 2014-2015 budget, it was necessary for the government to reduce operating expenditure in order to meet the operating expenditure targets mandated by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. In light of this, the Honorable Minister for Finance and Economic Development decided that cynical should be exempt from paying the segregated insurance fund fees for civil servants, retired civil servants, seafarers, and veterans retroactive to 1st of July 2014.
However, Sinico will continue to pay the segregated insurance fund fees for members or policyholders under the standard health insurance contract plans and for members employed with statutory authorities and government companies. This policy decision was made to eliminate the right pocket to left pocket transfer of funds back and forth between government and Sinico. Government would pay the premiums for civil servants, pensions and seafarers and veterans, inclusive of the segregated insurance fund contribution over to Sinico, and Sinico would remit the government segregated insurance fund contributions to the Ministry of Health. The effect was to artificially inflate government's expenditure, even though the funds were recollected and reflected in revenue. When the funds were collected, when the funds collected were then spent on indigent health care, they were effectively double counted in the expenditure. Removing this contribution for which the individuals the government pays health insurance premiums will result in a more accurate reflection of expenditure, only counting the funds once when they are spent on indigent care. Madam Speaker, as every member sitting here will be aware with this change, the revenue for the segregated insurance fund will decrease with no guarantee of a corresponding decrease in premiums paid by the government to Sinico on behalf of its members. However, I want to re-emphasize that Sinico will continue to collect and remit the segregated insurance fund contributions for its non-government clients, including the elderly, health impaired, and lower income insured groups. Madam Speaker, these amendments are the result of consultation with the Superintendent of Health Insurance, the Minister of Finance, and Sinico. I would also like to thank the Minister of Health and Culture staff and the staff of the Legislative Drafting Department for their dedication and support in ensuring these amendments were able to reach this House. I look forward, Madam Speaker, to receiving the support of this house so that the amendments can be brought into effect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Office of the, sorry, report of the Standing Business Committee, fourth meeting of the 2015-16 session of the Legislative Assembly to be laid on the table by the Honorable Premier, Minister of Home Affairs, Health and Culture. I recognize the Honorable Premier. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the report of the Standing Business Committee for the fourth meeting of the 2015-2016 session of the Legislative Assembly. So order, does the Honorable Premier wish to speak to this report? No, thank you, Madam Speaker. Office of the Auditor General, Cayman Islands Annual Report, 30th of June, 2015. To be laid on the table by the second elected member for Georgetown, former chairman of the Standing Public Accounts Committee. I recognize the honorable second elected member from the district of Georgetown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this honorable house the annual report of the Office of the Auditor General of the Cayman Islands for the year ended 30th of June, 2015. So ordered. Does the Honorable Second Elected Member from Georgia wish to expound upon his report? I do have some brief comments, Madam Speaker, with your indulgence. Please proceed. Colleagues, I am pleased to be tabling today the annual report of the Office of the Auditor General for the year ended 30th of June, 2015. As the former chair of the Public Accounts Committee, the current chairman has allowed me to bring this report forward in accordance with the provisions of the Public Management and Finance Law, and I thank him. The annual report is being tabled as provided for in the Public Management and Finance Law. More importantly, it contains pertinent accountability information about the Office of the Auditor General, including their annual financial statements, which have once again received an unqualified opinion from the accounting firm of Baker Tilly. 
The report provides members of the Legislative Assembly with information about the results achieved by the Office of the Auditor General in 2014-15, the activities it carried out to achieve those results, and the various types of work that the Office undertakes to ensure that it achieves its stated mission. The report also provides members with useful information about how the Office uses its resources. I would like all members of this House to read this report and, in the appropriate circumstances, use the information to ask questions about the operations of the Office and how they use public funds to achieve their stated mandate. This would close the accountability loop started when we appropriated funding for the Office in May 2014. I am pleased to report that the Office of the Auditor General continues to strive for accountability and transparency in the use of public funds and in doing so has contributed to the continuing improvements government has been making to its management framework. The annual report discusses the audit reports produced by the Office of the Auditor General for both the financial and performance audits he conducts in all of all government entities. The annual report includes a detailed discussion of the financial results of a section in a section called Management Discussion and Analysis. This section of the report, along with other key sections, meet the international reporting standards required by the International Pub Public Sector Accounting Standards Board in its latest practice guideline, guideline. As a former chair of the Public Accounts Committee, I hope that we will see more annual reports tabled by other entities in government that provide members of the Legislative Assembly with similar information to that of the Auditor General. That would continue the trend we have seen towards a more accountable public sector. Thank you, Madam Speaker. National Trust for the Cayman Islands Financial Statements and Independent Auditor's Report. 30th of June 2015-2014, to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Financial Services, Commerce and Environment. I recognize the Honorable Minister responsible for financial services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the annual the Financial Statements and Independent Auditors Report for the periods um, June 30th, 2015 and 2014 for the National Trust for the Cayman Islands. So ordered. Can somebody please call my sergeant into the chamber? Honorable Minister, would you wish to do both of them at the same time, or you want to do them individually? Madam Speaker, I think it would be convenient to do both at the same time. Agreed. National Trust for the Cayman Islands Annual Report, July 2014 to June 2015, to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Financial Services, Commerce and Environment. Honorable Minister for Financial Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the annual report um, for the National Trust for the Cayman Islands for July uh, 2014 to June 2015. So ordered. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak to these two reports? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Very br uh, briefly, if I may, the report, the annual report, Madam Speaker, is quite comprehensive um, and the audited financial statements um, are have been have been audited by the Auditor General and an opinion has been issued which is a qualified opinion Madam Speaker and just in respect of that sorry this is independent auditors um, and in respect of that, Madam Speaker, the basis for the qualified opinion is that, quote, the 
trust derives a substantial portion of its revenue from sources which cannot be fully controlled until they are entered into the accounting records and are therefore not susceptible to independent audit verification. However, notwithstanding that, um, Madam Speaker, except in, res in respect of matters described in relation to the qualified opinion, the auditors do believe that the financial statements presented do uh, represent fairly and in, in all material respects the financial position for the trust as at June 30th, um, 2015, and its financial performance and its cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with accounting principles uh, generally accepted. Madam Speaker, the report, as I said earlier, that is quite comprehensive and I certainly commend the reading of the report to um, the honorable mem members of this house um, as well as the, the public. Um, I think it very fairly and well um, highlights the activities of the, the National Trust for the Cayman Islands in, and, uh, in fulfilling their, their uh, legislative mandate. With that, Madam Speaker, I will uh, take my chair back. Cayman Maritime Annual Report 2014-15 to be laid on the table by the Honourable Minister of Financial Services, Commerce and Environment. Recognize the Honourable Minister for Financial Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the 2014-15 uh, Annual Report and the related audited financial statements for the Maritime Authority of the Cayman Islands for the financial year ended June 30th, 2015. So ordered. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak to it? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, the audited financial statements just table consists of the statement of financial position, statement of comprehensive income, statement of change in equity, statement of change in cash flows and the notes to the financial statements. Madam Speaker, the statement of financial position of the Maritime Authority as at June 30th, 2015, shows that the total assets were valued at five, CI dollars 5.1 million, which is an increase of 12.8% over the previous period. Total liabilities were CI 1.6 million, um, giving a total net worth increase of 7.7% which is up to um, CI 3.5 million. The statement of comprehensive income indicates that the authority reported and closed for the 12 months ended 30th June 2015, a comprehensive income of CI dollars 449,740. Just highlighting the operational side, um, Madam Speaker, Macy celebrated um, in June uh, of 2015 its 10th anniversary of operation. Um, the, the operations of, of uh, Macy reflect the activities which represent aggressive and effective competition against international, other international shipping registries, all of which are vying Similar, similar quality clients. The registry, Madam Speaker, maintains its dominance in the pleasure yacht market and is particularly strong in providing oversight and advisory services in the design and construction of large commercial yachts and more recently in the passenger yacht segment. The registry, the Cayman Islands registry, Madam Speaker, is a leading flag in the industry. It maintains a very large portfolio of new, new build yachts under both the large yacht code and the passenger yacht code um, new builds. We are responsible for the majority of the global passenger yacht code new build market. The vision, Madam Speaker, of the registry 
is to be the leading maritime administration in the provision of, accept of exceptional services to the global shipping industry and shipping community. In pursuit of this, Madam Speaker, uh, Macy has over the past year worked very closely with uh, Cayman Enterprise City to push forward the concept of making the maritime industry a um, separate economic pillar for the, the Cayman Islands and its current form of economy. The aim of the registry is to develop Cayman into a full service international maritime center and for Cayman to experience all of the added value that this new reality could create. This includes the creation of new jobs ranging from management, logistics, and crew operations to chandlery functions and onboard crew. The registry continues to operate, or sorry, to continues to explore, Madam Speaker, new markets in Brazil, Colombia, and Panama. Global reach has certainly been expanded with representation now in 14 locations worldwide. Madam Speaker, the registry in the Cayman Islands continue to maintain its white listing and low risk status across the three major port state control MOUs. And for the first time in Macy's history, the Tokyo MOU uh, on port state control listed the Cayman Islands in the top six performing maritime administrations in their 2014 report. Macy is also recognized as a leader in client services and is in fact International Organization for Standard or ISO, sorry, Standardization, ISO, certified to be the ISO 9000 uh, 2008 quality management standard. All of the above has culminated in the registry being recognized, Madam Speaker, by, again recognized by the International Chamber of Shipping as one of the top 14 performing uh, maritime administrations for the third consecutive year. Madam Speaker, I'd also like to mention the, that the Nairobi International Convention on the Removal of Wrecks uh, entered into force, force internationally on the 14th of April 2015. The convention provides that the, sorry, provides a the legal basis for states to remove or have removed shipwrecks that may have the potential to adversely affect the safety of lives, goods, and property at sea as well as the marine environment. It will make ship owners financially liable and require them to take out or provide other financial security to cover the costs of wreck removal. It will also provide states with a right of direct action against insurers. Flag states that have adopted the convention will continue, sorry, will issue the required wreck removal insurance certificate to the vessels that the uh, convention applies to for a fee. The Cayman Islands will request the extension of the, remo the Rep Removal Convention once local regulations are passed, which will give effect to the convention. Cayman will then be able to direct the removal of wrecks and be able to benefit from the right of direction, and the registry will, will then be able to issue certificates and generate earnings um, estimated currently in the region of just under 250,000 CI per annum. The in respect of the financial statements and the audited report, auditor's report, and Madam Speaker, there is a qualification. The basis for the qualification is that the authority could not recognize the estimated costs related to future obligations under its post-retirement health care plan as no actuar actuarial valuation had been completed. This um, actuarial valuation, Madam Speaker, will be completed by the end of May 2016 to determine the value of the post-retirement health care liability for the authority. In closing, Madam Speaker, I'd like to recognize and thank the current and previous boards, the management and staff um, of the, Mar the Maritime Authority of the Cayman Islands for an excellent job. It would be remiss of me also not to mention the continued support and cooperation of our ship owners, yacht managers, other global partners, and the local
private sector for their invaluable contributions via the Cayman Islands Shipowners Advisory Council, its associated yacht committee, and the local maritime sector consultative committee. Without this broad-based and genuine partnership, Madam Speaker, the authority in the registry would not be the successful global leader it is today. Thank you. The National Conservation Council promote and secure biological diversity and sustainable use of natural resources in the Cayman Islands. Annual report 2015 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Financial Services, Commerce and Environment. I once again recognize the Honorable Minister for Financial Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the annual report, I should say the first annual report, for the National Conservation Council of the Cayman Islands for the period of 12 September 2014 to 30th June 2015. So ordered. Does Honourable Minister wish to speak to this report? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the National Conservation Council was established by and facilitates the goals of the National Conservation Law. Which are one, to promote and secure biological diversity and the sustainable use of natural resources in the Cayman Islands. Two, to protect and conserve endangered, threatened, and endemic wildlife and their habitats. Three, to provide for protected terrestrial wetland and marine areas. And four, to give effect to the provisions of certain international uh, conventions. The functions of the National Conservation Council are set out in part two, section three of the law. Madam Speaker, the law regulates the composition of the council and it is comprised of 13 members. Those are eight persons appointed by cabinet and with, with certain technical qualifications, uh, a person nominated by the National Trust, as well as ex-official ex positions being the Director of Agriculture or his nominee, Director of Planning, um, Director of Environment, Director of, Dire of Deputy Director of Research for Environment um, at the Department of Environment. This first council, Madam Speaker, was appointed from the 12th of September until uh, September 2016. The council activities, um, Madam Speaker, include the adoption of a, so far include the adoption of a, a manual of policy and procedure, which was done at their meeting held on 3rd of December 2014. The manual contains rules for administration of the council, a code of conduct, a procedure for disclosure of interests, and a register of interests. The council chose to adopt the model code of conduct proposed by the Commission for Standards in Public Life, Madam Speaker. The Council held quarterly meetings from the 3rd of December 2014 on the following dates, uh, the 3rd of December 2014, 24th February 2015, and 26th of May 2015. All meetings have been held at the Government Administration Building, with the exception of the inaugural meeting which took place at the Department of Environment Conference Room. Madam Speaker, the National Conservation Council focused on preparing for the coming into force, or has been focused on preparing for the coming, in, coming into force of the remaining substantive portions of the law relating to conservation of land and wildlife, permits and licensing, enforcement and penalties, and general provisions. Over a series of preparatory work groups, the Department of Environment provided the Council with a detailed review of the law and a proposed order of entry into force of the remaining parts. The, Madam Speaker, the National Conservation Council also formed certain subcommittees to deal with significant issues, and these included, firstly, an invasive species uh, committee 
a climate, secondly, a climate change committee, and thirdly, the Alien Plant Importation Committee. Madam Speaker, in terms of council expenses, the initial budget for the for the council was submitted to the ministry for the entire 21 month, 21 month period from September 2014 to June 2016 inclusive, uh, with a total budget of CI 54,000, which was made up of council expenses uh, in meetings for nine months of CI 20,000. Uh, for 2015-16 council expenses, meetings for 12 months of 25,000, and for, for 2015-16 marine pr protected areas, designation and management plans expenses and species conservation plans expenses of CI 8,988. The Environmental Protection Fund, um, Madam Speaker, under Section 3.9 of the National Conservation Law provides that the Council shall manage and make recommendations of the use of the Environmental Protection Fund. However, Sections 46 and 47 of the law, which detail the operation management and reporting activities on uh, funds, on activities funded from the fund, have not been implemented uh, as yet. The fund, therefore, continues to be operated under the existing uh, structure, which describes the purpose of the fund as defraying expenditure incurred in protecting and preserving, preserving the environment of the islands. As such, Madam Speaker, this report merely notes that the Cayman Islands government 2015-16 um, annual plan and estimates forecasted that the closing balance of the fund for 2014-15 would be approximately 56300 in the year ahead, yes. In the year ahead, Madam Speaker, in addition to its other duties under the law, the Council's main goals and objectives for the financial year 15-16 uh, will be the to provide input for the implementation of parts five and seven of the law, which is a critical priority, so that the Council and the Department of Environment can function effectively. Secondly, to complete the enhanced marine protection area consultations, which they have done with recommendations made to the cabinet. Thirdly, to commence implementation of a management plan procedure for marine protected areas, assuming those are approved. Fourthly, initiate terrestrial protected areas nomination processes, protection of areas of crown land and our conservation agreements in respect of private land. They will also be reviewing and implementing three to five uh, series, sorry, species conservation plans, Madam Speaker. They will also be developing council policy in relation to climate change adaptation and mitigation with a view to, handle it, to providing advice to the ministry and cabinet on that important area in addition to developing an overall vision for the Council's implementation of its functions and a five-year plan. Finally, Madam Speaker, they will, be, they will continue to be engaged in outreach and education opportunities with conservation partners. I'd like to take the opportunity as the Minister for the Environment, Madam Speaker, to sincerely thank all of the Council members for their hard work and also unselfish dedication and service to the people of these islands through their work on the National Conservation Council. Thank you. The Tax Information Authority, Tax agree Information Agreements Order 2016, to be laid on the table by the Honourable Minister of Financial Services, Commerce and Environment. I recognize the Honorable Minister responsible for financial services. Madam Speaker, I beg to, to lay on the table of this Honorable House the Tax Information Authority.
Authority Tax Information Agreements Order 2016 issued under the Tax Information Authority Law uh, 2014 revision. So ordered, does the Honorable Minister wish to speak for the report? Madam Speaker, the purpose of laying the, the order uh, is in conjunction with a separate government motion which will be brought subsequently on the, and is listed on the order paper. So I will speak to it in more detail at that time. Thank you. The eighth report of the Commission for Standards in Public Life, 20th of August, 2013 to the 15th of February, 2014. I recognize Honorable DG, Deputy Governor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the eighth report of the Commission for Standards in Public Life, which covers both the reporting period, sorry, which covers the reporting period 20th of August 2013 to the 15th of February 2014. So ordered. Does the Honorable Deputy Governor wish to lead a ninth report at the same time, or do you wish to speak separately? Okay, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I shall offer a brief, a brief review, overview of the eighth report of the Commission on Standards in Public Life, which covers the progress made and the key issues arising from the completed work by the Commission during their final six months in office, we now have a, a new um, commission with a new chair. That is before, that is the period 20th of August 2013 to the 15th of February 2014. Madam Speaker, during the reporting period, the commission reiterated its desire to see reports of its commission laid before the House as soon as practicable possible. Continue to reaffirm its undertaking to uphold promote and apply the seven core principles which form the basis of a universal standard of good governance. They also worked with our, our, on our procurement law, and I want to thank them for the work that they have done that, and it should be going to our cabinet shortly. The Commission also witnessed the unanimous passing in this Honorable House of the Standards in Public Life Law 2014, the Commission also spent a considerable amount of time reviewing the matters of conflicts of interest with respect to public officials, participating in discussions and reviewing best practices as it relates to procedures for appointing members to public authorities and, and their terms of appointment. Madam Speaker, over their four-year term, the members of the Commission have been able to assist in the setting of the highest standards of integrity and competence by creating a code of conduct which incorporated the Nolan principles recommended for use by all boards and committees associated with our statutory authorities and government-owned companies and all executive, chief executive officers and directors of our statutory authorities and government-owned companies. They also monitored standards of ethical conduct by providing guidance on conflicts of interest Sourcing legal clarity on the meaning, meaning of the remit and reviewing the draft ministerial code of conduct, which we are most grateful for. Reviewing extensively the existing process and made in-depth recommendations for awarding public contracts. They have reviewed existing procedures for appointing members to public authorities and subsequently made recommendations and created a declaration form for use by public officials recommended the Nolan Principles as the seven core principles which govern standards, standards in public life. Submitted reports every six months to this Honorable House, this report being its eighth such report. Engaged in numerous community engagements and public relations. Madam Speaker, they also promoted openness and transparency through the posting of minutes and other relevant documents to their website.
Madam Speaker, I wish to thank the chairperson, Ms. Karen Thompson, MBE, as well as members, Ms. Nida May Flatley and Hedler Robinson, and Mr. Ian White for their dedication to the work of the commission during their four years, four years tender. We owe them all a depth of gratitude for their hard work. Madam Speaker, finally, I would encourage members of this house and the public to familiarize themselves with the contents of the, of the report, which is available on the commission's website, which is www.standardsinpubliclifecommission.ky. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The ninth report of the Commission for Standards in Public Life, 1st of February 2015 to 31st of July 2015, to be laid on the table by the Honorable Deputy Governor, ex officio member responsible for the civil service. Recognize the Honorable Deputy Governor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the ninth report of the Commission for Standards in Public Life, which covers the period 1st of February 2015 to the 31st of July 2015. So order, does the Honorable Deputy Governor wish to expound further? Yes, Madam Speaker, briefly. Madam Speaker, the ninth report of the Commission for Standards, Standards in Public Life, which relate to the period 1st of February 2015 to the 31st of July 2015, the Commission for Standards in Public Life was reconstituted in February 2015 under the leadership of Ms. Rosa Whitaker Miles, along with members Ms. Sheena Hislop and Pastor Cheyenne O'Connor. This report covers the progress made and the key issues arising from the work completed by the Commission during their first six months in office. During the reporting period, the new members sought to bring, to bring themselves up to date on the work of the previous Commission. They reviewed the standards in public life law and consider possible amendments to the law and the relevant content for the standards in public life re regulations. In addition, the chairman accepted an invitation to attend the Commonwealth Caribbean Association of, of Integrity Commissions and Anti-Corruption Bodies in Grenada from the 20, 21st to the 27th of, of June 2015, whose theme was Strengthening Integrity Commissions and Anti-Corruption Bodies in the Commonwealth Caribbean. The Commission has also hosted several introductory meetings with relevant personnel. Madam Speaker, in the next reporting period, the Commission intends to follow through with the arrangements in place to host additional meetings so that they can familiarize themselves with the, with the work, continue to work towards bringing into force the standards in public life law, and that is on our agenda here to, um, during this meeting, Madam Speaker along with the relevant um, regulations. They intend to review the current register of interests supervised by the clerk of, the, of this parliament, engage the media, the private sector, and the general work on the commission and on the need for the involvement of all in the fight against corruption through greater transparency and accountability by all persons in public life. They also intend to engage in local and regional cooperation efforts where possible and continue to build on the work of the previous commission. Madam Speaker, finally, I, I again encourage members of the House and to the public to familiarize, familiarize themselves with the contents of the report, which is available online at the commission's uh, website. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Annual Report of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Cayman Islands, 2014 to 2015, to be laid on the table by the Honorable Deputy Governor, ex officio member responsible for the portfolio of the Civil Service. I recognize the Honorable Deputy Governor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to lay at the table on this Honorable House the Annual Report of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Cayman Islands as of the 30th of June, 2015. So ordered. Does the Honorable Deputy Governor wish to speak to the Civil Aviation Authority report? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, briefly. Madam Speaker, I will speak to the annual report and, and then uh, speak a, a bit about the um, financial statements as of June 2015. 
Madam Speaker, I know that it's been the, um, the desire of our Auditor General to ensure that not only our financial statements table in the LA, but their annual report. I think that was just said by um, the former chair of the Public Accounts Committee. So I want to acknowledge the work of the Director General of Civil Aviation for um, going forward and completing this annual report, which sets out in detail the work of the CAA. Madam Speaker, the annual report, the 2014-2015 financial year, despite increasing, the challenge, increasing challenges, was another successful year for the authority, which has resulted in the highest net income ever realized. This result is a testament to the prudent management of the authority's finances and the critical decision making by the authority's management, in addition to the commitment and dedication of its employees. And I certainly wish to record my thanks for their hard work and their diligence and professional ability. The C AACI is one of the few statutory authorities that relies on non-coercive -co revenue for, for sub sustainability through the operation of its offshore aircraft register. The authority is the unique public service entity that competes in the global market for the registration of aircrafts. And they do this worldwide Many jurisdictions recognize the potential of this lucrative asset management activity, and as a result, the CAACI faces increasing competition from other jurisdictions around the world who have established aircraft registers. In addition, the CAACI faces the challenge of attracting and retaining appropriate human capital resources as regulatory activities dictate that we need high, highly specific and technical qualified persons who can provide excellent service. And of course, the work that they do surrounds safety. And as we know, keeping the persons who fly safe, to, safe is the paramount consideration. While there are many factors beyond the control of the authority that would influence its financial performance, management continues a diligent approach to ensure that efficiencies and service levels are optimized through, through training, IT implementation and upgrades, adherence to sound regulatory standards and appropriate staff recognition and incentives. In addition to the financial performance, which I will comment on next, it should be recognized that the authority has maintained the governor's, des the governor's designation for regulatory oversight of all functional areas following successive assessments by the UK Air, Air Safety Support International, which is carried out as a means of assessing the ability of the authority to comply with the UK international aviation obligations under the Convention on International Civil Aviation, also known as the Chicago Convention. Components of the financial statements, the audited financial statements just tabled, Madam Speaker, consists of the statement of financial position, the statement of comprehensive income, the statement of cash flows, etc. Madam Speaker, growth in equity. The authority for the fiscal year 30 to June 2015 indicated that the net assets of the organization have increased by 1 million and 380,000 or 40 percent. Again, that is excellent. However, the equity at the end of 2014 and, and 2013 were restated down by 1,462,000 to account for the post-retirement pension and health care obligations of the long-serving staff. These two obligations were subject to two separate actuarial valuations carried out by Mercer and produce recommendations. I, sorry, these two obligations were subject of two separate actuarial valuations carried out by Mercer and produced recommendations, IAS, International Accounting Standards, 
presentations resulted at June 2015, 2014, and 2013. The net worth of, this, of the authority stood at CI 4.8 million as of the 30th of June 2015 and includes all of the recommendation adjustments in the Mercer actuarial valuation for those contingent liabilities. Operating activities during the, the, the year ending 30th of June 2015. Madam Speaker, in terms of the operating activity of the authority during the, the fiscal year, 30th of June 2015, the following summary is pertinent for the authority. They produced total revenue of CI 7.34 million, with just over $6 million of that being attributable, attributable to the aircraft registry. Incurred total expenses of CI 4.1 million. Generated an operating surplus in the amount of CI 3.2 million before remeasurement of the post employment benefit obligation, producing a positive adjustment of 318,000, which resulted in a total comprehensive income for the year of 3.55 million. Madam Speaker, the Auditor General issued an unqualified opinion. And this is becoming the norm now in the um, public service on the financial position of the authority as of the 3rd of June 2015. In the past, the financial statements have been qualified because of the pension evaluation, which I had mentioned earlier. That matter has now been addressed. So, Madam Speaker, the Auditor General has stated that the financial statements present fairly in all material all material respects, the financial position of the C Civil Aviation Authority of the Cayman Islands as of 30th of June 2015. And finally, Madam Speaker, I just want to congratulate the, the, the Director General and his team for their outstanding work that has realized these outstanding performance. And we look forward to another productive year from him and his team. Thank you. Ministry of District Administration, Tourism and Transport Annual Financial Statements for the year ended 30th of June 2015 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Deputy Premier, Minister of District Administration, Tourism and Transport. Recognize the Honorable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, thank you. I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the audited financial statements of the Ministry of District Administration tourism and transport for the fiscal year ended 30th of June, 2015. So ordered. Does the Honorable Deputy Premier wish to speak there at all? Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. A few brief remarks. Madam Speaker, the audited financial statements show that the revenue for the year ended 30th of June, 2014 was $28,988,000. There was a surplus of 711000 Ministry had total assets equaling 21,220,000, resulting in a positive net worth of 19,110,000. Madam Speaker, the Acting Auditor General states, in my opinion, except for the possible effects of the matters described in the basis for a qualified opinion, the financial statements present fairly, in all material respects, the financial position of the Ministry of District Administration, Tourism, and Transport as of June 30th, 2015. And its financial performance for the year then ended in accordance with international public sector accounting standards. Madam Speaker, the Ministry still has work to do in order to accomplish an unqualified audit opinion. As always, we must continue to move forward and strive for further improvement in the accountability process. Madam Speaker, the Ministry's team, led by the Chief Officer and the Chief Financial Officer, are working hard with their team to achieve an unqualified audit. So I take this opportunity to thank the Ministry's staff, the Office of the Acting Auditor General, for the hard work that has gone into producing the audited financial statements of the Ministry. I now invite the members of this Honorable House and the public to review the reports in detail. Thank you, Madam Speaker.
Cayman Islands Electricity Regul Regulatory Authority, 2014-15 Annual Report. Cayman Islands Electricity Regulatory Authority Financial Statements for the year ended 30th of June 2015 to be laid on the table by the Honourable Minister of Planning, Lands, Agriculture and Infrastructure. Recognize the Honourable Minister responsible for infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the 2014-15 annual report and the financial statements for the ERA for the year ending June 30th, 2015. So ordered. Does the Honourable Minister wish to speak to the report and financial statements? Very briefly, Madam Speaker, the, the annual report members are invited to peruse and that paints a picture of the activities of the authority for the year but just to point out in the auditor general's letter to the board of directors of the ERA in his final paragraph he says in my opinion, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the Electricity Regulatory Authority as at 30th June 2015 and its comprehensive income and its cash flow for the year then ended in accordance with international financial reporting standards. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ministry of Finance, Finance, Tourism and Development, Public Financial Annual Financial Statements for the year ended 30th of June 2013 to be laid on the table by the Honourable Minister of Finance and Economic Development. Recognise the Honourable Minister responsible for finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honourable House the annual financial statements for the Ministry of Finance Tourism and Development, Public Finance. So ordered. Does the Honorable Minister of Finance wish to speak to it? No thanks, Madam Speaker. Financial statements for the Government of the Cayman Islands for the year in the 30th of June 2014 to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Finance and Economic Development. I once again recognize the Honorable Minister for Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the financial statements for the Government of the Cayman Islands for the year ended 30th June 2014. So ordered. Does the Honorable Minister wish to speak further to this? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will. Madam Speaker, on the 24th of September 2015, the Auditor General issued an adverse opinion on the financial statements for the government of the Cayman Islands for the year ended 30th June 2014. And on the 26th of November 2015, Madam Speaker, I made a detailed statement to the honorable members of this house on these very same audited financial statements explaining the reasons for the adverse opinion and the actions that are being taken to address the audit qualification, Madam Speaker. Since that detailed statement has already been provided to the House, Madam Speaker, it is not necessary to provide another extensive statement on the reasons for the adverse opinion. Therefore, I will briefly highlight the action plan that the government has in place to address the macro issues that resulted in the adverse opinion. Madam Speaker, 
whilst 37 of the 42 public sector entities have received unqualified or clean and qualified audit opinions on their 2013-14 financial statements. The Auditor General has issued an adverse opinion on the 2013-14 entire public sector or EPS consolidated financial statements. This requires an explanation, Madam Speaker, because the public will not readily understand how an adverse opinion is issued on the EPS consolidated financial statements where 37 of the 42 public sector entities have received either an unqualified being a clean opinion or a qualified audit opinion. The reason for the adverse opinions are not due to audit issues occurring in the underlying financial statements, Madam Speaker. Instead, the adverse opinion is due to the accounting treatment and macro issues that impact the EPS consolidated statements. The macro issues that have led to an adverse opinion on the EPS 2013-14 consolidated financial statements, Madam Speaker, include number one, material omissions, number two, property plant and equipment valuation and completeness, Number three, erroneous opening and closing balances. Number four, revenue and related receivables completeness. And number five, consolidation integrity issues. Madam Speaker, the government has put in place an action plan that addresses each of the macro issues. Madam Speaker, turning now to number one, Considering an amendment to the Public Management and Finance Law, which will permit the use of a modified version of the International Public Sector Accounting Standard, number 25, and allow the government to disclose details of the post-retirement health care liabilities and expenses in the notes to the financial statements, as opposed to being shown on the face of those financial statements, Madam Speaker. Number two. Reviewing the public sector pensions law with the view of segregating the assets of the public sector of the public service pension board and those of the three pension plans and mandating separate reporting for each pension plan. Number three, ensuring that fixed asset revaluations are conducted on a five year cycle in order to ensure consistency of accounting policies across the EPS, Madam Speaker. Number four, requiring the audit office to complete all of its audits within the legislated two months time frame for entity audits so that audit adjustments are properly reflected in the entire public sector consolidated financial statements. And number five, Conducting a review of the government's revenue items to determine steps necessary to improve the completeness of recorded revenues. And number six, requiring public sector entities to confirm and agree interagency charges along with implementing the advanced global intercompany system to assist with interagency eliminations. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance will be producing a public finance manual which will be in accordance with the best practices and generally accepted accounting principles, or otherwise known as GAAP. The manual will be disseminated to all public sector entities and will serve to improve the consistency in the application of GAAP. It is expected that this manual will be completed by the 30th of June, 2016. Madam Speaker, the adverse opinion of the 1314 EPS Consolidated Financial Statements is the first audit opinion that has been issued on the EPS statements since the Public Management and Finance Law was introduced in 2004. Prior to the 2013 EPS Consolidated Financial Statements, 
Such earlier years were given a disclaimer of opinion by the Auditor General's office, which meant that it was not possible to reach an opinion on the consolidated financial statements for the years prior to 2013-14 fiscal year. An adverse opinion, Madam Speaker, is not an opinion that satisfies the government. However, the government sees this as a significant attestation that financial evidence, retention, and reporting has improved. The government intends to use this opportunity to address the macro issues that cause the issuance of the adverse opinion and aims to achieve greater accountability and transparency. Madam Speaker, the Audit Office is currently in the process of conducting its audit on the entire public sector consolidated financial statements for the financial year ended 30th June 2015. It is important to note that the government will not have resolved all of the macro issues that were related to the 2013-14 financial statements, Madam Speaker. However, as mentioned above, the government has put in place a plan of action that will in due course and time resolve issues and improve the audit opinion being received. As soon as the audit of the 2014-15 EPS financial statement is completed, Madam Speaker, the government will present them for tabling in this honorable house. A copy of the financial statements for the government of the Cayman Islands for the year ended 2013-14, sorry, for the year ended June 30th, 2014, uh, Madam Speaker, is available on the Minister of Finance and Economic Development's website, which is www.mof.gov.ky. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Government of the Cayman Islands, Charon and Youth Services Foundation, annual financial statements for the year ending the 30th of June, 2015, to be laid on the table by the Honorable Minister of Community Affairs, Youth and Sports. Recognize Honorable Minister responsible for Community Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the report and audited financial statements for the Children and Youth Services, or Keys Foundation, for the year ended June 30, 2015. So ordered. Does the Honorable Minister wish to speak further to the report? Briefly, Madam Speaker. Statements? Thanks. Madam Speaker, Members are aware the functions of the Keys Foundation's operations include the management and operation of the Francis Bodden Girls Home, a 24-hour residential facility for youth who require care due to being deemed in need of care and protection and, and girls exhibiting offending behaviors that have been court ordered, as well as the Bonaventure Boys Home, including the Phoenix House, 24-hour residential facility for youth who have been remanded or committed by the courts for youth rehabilitation, rehabilitative services. Madam Speaker, Keys continues to assist the government in meeting its legal obligations under the Children's Law 2012 revision and the Youth Justice Law 2005 revision. Due to the complex issues that at-risk youth experience, Keys continues to reevaluate its therapeutic programs and expand its services to ensure that appropriate residential treatment is available for those boys and girls who are not able to remain with their families. The Keys Foundation received a qualified opinion on the financial statements for the financial year ended June 30, 2015. This qualified opinion is common with many charitable organizations. The foundation as the foundation derives a substantial portion of its income from donations, fundraising events, and similar activities, the completeness of which is not susceptible to audit. However, had the Office of the Auditor General been able to extend audit to the completeness of such income, it may have been determined that adjustments were necessary to income. 
Madam Speaker, while conducting the audit of the Keyes Foundation 2015 financial statements, it was the opinion of the Office of the Auditor General, except for the effects of the matter described in the basis for qualified opinion, the financial statements presented fairly in all material respects the financial position of the Foundation as of June 30, 2015. Additionally, its financial performance and cash flows for the year ended in accordance with international financial reporting standards. Madam Speaker and members of this Honorable House, the tabling of the Keys Foundation accounts for the year ended 30 June 2015 brings the Ministry of Community Affairs, Youth and Sports up to date with the accounts that have been audited by the Auditor General. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Ministry and the agencies that fall under for ensuring that these accounts were tabled in a timely manner. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions to Honourable Ministers and members of the Cabinet? Recognised Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, it is now approaching quarter of 12, and therefore I beg to move the suspension of Standing Order 23, 7 and 8 to allow questions, question time to begin and continue beyond the hour of 11 o'clock. The question is, is that Standing Order 23, 7 and 8 be suspended to allow the questions to commence and continue beyond the hour of 11 a.m. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. I believe the ayes have it. Accordingly, Standing Order 23, 7 and 8 is hereby suspended. Madam Clark, the chair is going to take the morning break at this time. We'll reconvene at 12.